Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Radio Network Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. All right, coming back on 14 past the hour, 877-448-0433. Greg at the BBQ Central Show dot com are two ways to get in touch with the show. Uh, joining me now, an award-winning barbecue pit master, a teacher of all things barbecue and grilling, someone who has seen not only whole hogs cooked, but whole ho- uh, whole cows hooked. Head cook for Teddy Bears competition team, sponsor of the show, Conrad Haskins joins us here. Conrad, welcome back. How are you, buddy? Good, Greg. How are you? I'm doing absolutely fabulous, Conrad. Always appreciate you making time for the show. You know, I mentioned it right there at the top. You know, a lot of people see whole hog cooks, but you are like one of the few that's actually seen whole, is it whole cow or whole steer, or how do you actually term that properly? Whole steers and, uh, yeah, whole steers. So I, I remember we talked about the very first time I ever had you on the show, and to see a 200-pound pig on a spit probably isn't as majestical or perhaps downright frightening as it would see to have like a, a ton, a steer that weighs a ton on a spit. I mean, how does that work out exactly? It takes a whole lot longer to do it. Um, and it takes a whole lot of labor because it, I, I don't do my whole hogs on a spit, but the whole steers were done on a spit. So those were, um, you know, just turning them constantly for like 24 hours Tending the fire, basting them, it's a whole lot of work. Oh, I can't imagine. And is the uh, barbecue that comes off of that uh, even better than normal? Is it like steak or pulled beef, or how does it how does it come out? Like beef ribs and stuff? You know, it, it, it's completely different. It, 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 it is sliced. It's, it, it, it's not pulled. But, you know, the, the whole hog, when you do a whole hog, the pulled pork that comes off of it, has a special flavor which you just can't get from pork shoulder. And it's the same way with beef. When you've cooked the whole animal like that for so long and with so much care and love, the, the flavor just has something magical about it. Conrad Haskins joining us here on the show. Conrad, if you don't mind me asking, where does Teddy Bear come from exactly? Teddy Bear is my nickname. has been since I was a kid. All right, so something that has stuck right with you. You know, you, you run the Barbecue Institute, a wide array of classes for folks to choose from out there. When did you decide that this was going to be the way you were going to be making your living at the Barbecue Institute? Well, I, I decided, to, decided to start teaching in 2004 and had a lot of fun with it. And then I um, got divorced. And when I got divorced, the ex-wife got the restaurant and I got the barbecue school, which is exactly what I wanted to happen. And I couldn't be more happy just teaching all the time. You, you didn't want to stay in the restaurant business anymore? <laughs> Uh, the best analogy I've heard of the restaurant business is it's owning a herd of dairy cows, and I completely agree with that analogy. <laughs> you know, uh, I guess what I find most interesting about Barbecue Institute and the classes, you know, when you look at some price points at some of the other folks who are giving competition cooking classes, Conrad, you know, what kind of crosses your mind? Are, are some of these guys in it for a cash grab? Is it publicity? You know, are they doing it for the right reasons? Because I guess if we're being honest with each other, on the whole, your classes probably aren't nearly as expensive as some of these other guys. And your uh, elite list of students almost reads like a who's who of who's gone through your program. Well, I have been very fortunate. I mean, I've been doing this since 2004. So, you know, a lot of people when they started out, like Harry Sue and those kind of folks, took my class and they've gone on to great success. Um, I decided very early on I wasn't going to focus on being a competition school. I was going to focus on helping people cook better barbecue. And that does help you win contests, but it's not my main goal. My main goal is to help the backyarder and the restaurateur cook better barbecue. Um, And, you know, I can't talk to all these programs. The only competition class that I've been through is Rod Gray's. And I know that he's not holding anything back. And, you know, the proof of that is... Look at all his students that have beat him, including me, two weeks after I took his class. I took first place chicken with him cooking right next to me. Proof positive, I would say. Class well worth its money. Absolutely. Uh, Conrad Haskins joining us here on the show. Uh, He runs Barbecue Institute, which you can find at bbqinstitute.com. All right, so let's go ahead. Uh, You know, school is in session. Get your teacher's cap on there, teddy bear. Uh, everyone else, grab your pen and paper. So let's go ahead and we'll talk about some common mistakes uh, that you're seeing as far as cooks making right now, firing up the, the grills and cookers. What are you seeing out there that are common mistakes? 
Um, well, the common mistakes are, you know, always too much rub, too much smoke, too much heat, and what I call getting too cute. People are trying to do too much. Some of the best briskets I've ever cooked in my life, the only ingredients involved was a brisket, high quality salt and high quality pepper and nothing else. And, you know, if, if you've got good technique, you can turn out some of the most amazing brisket you've ever tasted in your life just with those three ingredients. I mean, so how, how hard is it for you as someone who is a teacher? You know, and, and when I've talked to the pit masters, and it almost kind of ties back to that whole competition class and, you know, are they given for the right reasons? You know, people have always told me, look, I, I can sit here and I'll tell you exactly what I use and how much I'm using. This. But there seems to be one kind of important part how the hell you actually cook it. And if you don't know how to do it right and produce good chicken and pork ribs and pork shoulder and brisket, doesn't matter if you have all the flavor profiles if you can't cook it right. So how does one go about getting the tools and arming themselves with the information on cooking the meat right first, and then we can kind of move on to the flavor profile here a second? You know, I think that's a great question. Um, Basically, I can give people the knowledge how to cook it, but they need experience. And what I'm seeing massively out there is people want an autopilot. Well, the thing is, when the autopilot doesn't work, you still need to fly the plane. So you need the pilot, and you need the piloting skills on how to fly the plane when the autopilot isn't working. So it's not a cupcake recipe, which is one of my favorite sayings. And you know how to need to run your pit without a computer running it, um, you need to know what to do when things go wrong. And I think those are the two big things, experience, knowing how to run your pit without a computer running it. That really gives you the confidence to succeed, whereas, you know, somebody who's following exactly the recipe that Rod Gray gave them and they've got a computer running their pit, on a good day, they might very well take first place. But what separates the men from the boys is when things go wrong, do you have the experience to still be able to succeed when your computer broke, um, it was blowing sideways, it was the middle of a blizzard, you were trying to cook at 9,000 feet at 20 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, that's where really experience, which I can't teach, comes into play. And too many people now want this cupcake recipe, and it's not a cupcake recipe. It's experience and skill and knowledge based on a solid foundation, which really is what's going to make you a pit master versus a computer operator. Conrad Haskins joining us here on the show, uh, talking a little bit about how to get that meat uh, prepared correctly. So, you know, after you've put in the time, you learn the pit, uh, you're able to, I don't want to say master, uh, can, can, do you think you can ever reach, uh, are you ever mastering the art of cooking it, or is it something that you're always evolving and you're always learning? Well, my expression long before I ever got into barbecue was, if you stop learning, you start dying. And I've talked talk to people in barbecue, outside of barbecue, if, if, if you're not learning from what's going on, even if you've a master in your field and you've been there for 40, 50 years, you really, you, you've got an attitude problem because there is always, always something to learn. Jim Minion told me when I started, and I mean, I started quickly, 16 weeks from my first contest to qualifying for the Jack Daniels World Championship and cooking it. Um, so, I mean, I was very fast out of the gate. And Jim Minion told me, you know, you're going to get better. And I kind of shook my head and I was like, okay, yeah. Well, 10 years later, Jim Minion was right. I, I always look at it, and I think one of the things that separates the, the great pit masters from the people who want to be great pit masters is we're our own worst critics. How could I have done that better? Okay, that was great, but how do I make it even better than that? And, and, and when you constantly push yourself like that, that's what keeps you on top of your game. All right, so once we have the, the meat where we feel comfortable, we know the cooker, we're not reliant on gurus and stokers and, and all this other stuff, which are great tools to have, no doubt about it. But like you said, always good to know your cooker in case of a catastrophic event. How do you go about adding the layers of flavor? As you said, too much smoke, too much rub. Is it always best to start out little and build from there, or are you uh, catering to specific people that are coming over or not coming over? How do you how do you build a flavor profile and do it correctly? Um, well, there's a multi part answer to that. You know, step A is you have to have been blessed by God with a good palate. Some people, I've, I've spoken to people that says all restaurant barbecue is good, and I mean. 
I've got a thousand people, myself included, who are going to say, no, not all restaurant barbecue is good. There's good and there's bad. Um, I think, A, you need to have been blessed with a good palate. B, I think KISS, keep it simple, stupid. People try to make it way too complicated. Um, and, you know, I, I get a lot of people asking me, well, how do you handle national variations, I mean, regional variations within, within a nation? Um, and basically... I don't vary my flavor profile at all, whether I'm cooking on the West Coast, East Coast, Texas, uh, you know, North Central, whatever. What I do do is I dial up my sweetness and I dial down my sweetness. Because there's folks out there who don't do anything, but they cook massively, like 30 contests a year, which is way more than I, I'll ever cook. Um, and when you're cooking that many contests, you can actually, just on the numbers game, stick to an exact flavor profile and on the numbers game if it's good you're going to win what i do is like when i went to new york and took reserve grand champion and, and beat iq was i was like this is new york it's sweet's not going to work so i massively dial it down and talking to judges afterwards they were all complaining about how much candy they'd eaten so you know doing well there was because i dialed back the sweetness but i don't change my flavor profile i think i've got a good flavor profile it works from coast to coast so I'm just going to take up my best guess at do these guys want sweet or savory and how much sugar and honey I add and just adjust that and leave the basic flavor profile alone. Conrad Haskins joining us here on the show from the Barbecue Institute. You can find him at uh, bbqinstitute.com. Also, the uh, pitmaster of Teddy Bear's competition team, you can find that at bbqhog.com. Uh, Conrad, one of the best things about barbecue today is the ease of access to good information. One of the worst things about barbecue today, the ease of access to crappy information. Now, can you list out some of the most common Internet falsehoods that are proliferating the Internet right now? Uh, I, we don't have long enough to do it, but I mean, <laughs> right. you know, some of the basic things are um, you have to cook your brisket fat side up. Uh, you have to spray. Um, oiling meat is a good idea. Uh and it just goes on and on and on. I mean, I, I get so many calls from students and people who are like, I've read the Internet for three days on how to cook ribs, and I'm now more confused than when I started reading the Internet. There's, because what happens is every right answer is out there. Everything I do, everything Rod Gray does, everything Harry Sue does is out there. But it's like panning for gold. You've got these little flecks of gold surrounded by vast amounts of dirt, and you have to separate the gold from the dirt. And it, it's not like panning for gold because... With panning for gold, you've got the, sh the shiny parts and the dirt, and here you've just got this vast stream of information, and it's what do you do? And people just, it's like, oh, well, I'm going to try that, and I'm going to try that, and I'm going to try that, and it, it just, it doesn't work. Stick to the basics and build on that, and don't try to make it too complicated. And I think the biggest single thing I have with my students is that they think that, well, I'm just going to go to the grocery store. You know, the question is, well, how do I go to the grocery store and get a good brisket? You don't. Um, unfortunately, brisket these days is what's the cheapest feeder cattle, what's the cheapest cereal, you know, how do we make a profit and sell it to Walmart so they can sell it for 99 cents a pound? And you just can't get a good brisket doing that. If you don't start with good ingredients, you're not going to have a good end product. And I see so many threads, and it hasn't changed in 10 years of, well, I had a problem cooking brisket, and all these answers flood in with all these advanced techniques, and nobody says, okay, but what did you start with? Was it good meat or wasn't it? Because if you didn't start with good meat, all those advanced techniques are just worthless. All right, so let me ask you about this, and I'm glad you brought up the uh, the beef part specifically, because I don't hear it so much with pork, but I suppose that's another uh, argument or another conversation for another day. You know, there was a lot of hype around Wagyu beef. Uh, there was a lot of talk about people using uh, the certified Angus uh, beef for packers. I mean, you, you've competed a lot. You are doing these classes. Do you recommend Wagyu? Is that overpriced and not needed? Is it? Can you go to Sam's and, and do just as well? What do you think about all that? Different levels and, and varying of all this popular stuff being thrown around the uh, the internet these days. You know, I did a I did an advanced barbecue class, and we cooked a Wagyu, and we cooked a Cargill Sterling Silver side by side. The Wagyu, I didn't inject the the uh, Cargill Sterling Silver. I injected. We did a taste test. There was nothing in it. Um, so, 
you know, I've won with Wagyu, but I really don't think it's necessary. I think if you have a really good quality piece of regular beef, you can do it. And I, yeah, I, I, I'm with Dave. I'm shying away from certified Angus or any of that stuff. Is the vendor you're actually buying the meat from putting out a good product? Dave has his choices. I choose to use Cargill Sterling Silver. Um, and there's other good brands out there, but I think you need to go with a good brand and have faith in that brand and, and go with that because, and, and as far as Sam's goes, I've won with Sam's, but I've also seen their quality decline. And right now the only good brisket I'm seeing coming out of Sam's is their, their choice flats because on their packers, they've gone to select from choice and there's a big difference in flavor. And, and I can't recommend the, the packers coming out of Sam's anymore. Unfortunately, Conrad Haskins joining us here on the show. Uh, Connor, what kind of a, a competition schedule, in it, if any, are you going to have this year? Um, I'm doing a few contests. I'm cooking Sam's. I'm cooking a contest in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll pick up a few more as, as the year progresses. But it's a fairly light schedule for me. I cooked one early this year and took first place um, in brisket. So, but I, I'm, I still enjoy competing. You know, you mentioned that you were going to try a Sam's Club. I asked Jeff Brown this a little bit earlier as far as is Sam's Club kind of kind of a monster in the fact that it is taken away from some competing events or, or some events that have been well established for years prior to Sam's showing up, and now they're taking teams away. Uh, other events are suffering. Do you see this as, as a corporate evil kind of uh, invading into a territory that had already been established, uh, or do you see it kind of like uh, Mike McLeod said from MMA, where you know some of these guys, they're just not marketers. They don't realize how to, to get out there and get sponsorship money and be proactive with it. Um, well, I agree because I've, I've I've seen this in my own uh, experience with a small barbecue association that it's not run by business people and they don't know how to market it. A barbecue contest has to appeal to the public. Sam's isn't putting money into it. Um, because of the competitors, they're putting money into it because of the uh, because of this of the spectators, and and that's who I think you really have to cater to. And um, I just think that it's it's all about the spectators. And you know, the only, the only constant we have in this world is change, and things are going to change. And people hate it when they change, but that's what's going to happen. And if, if they're bringing money to it, more power to them. All right, let me ask you about this, too, before I cut you loose, Conrad. Uh, Pitmaster Season 3, I always like to give people's ideas and, and takes on this. It's coming back. We don't know for sure what kind of a format we're going to see. You know, Season 1, as we look back now, widely considered to be the gold standard of what competition barbecue was like and, and wants to be seen on television. Season 2, the complete antithesis of that. Everybody seemed to, to not like it to a large degree, format-wise. So who knows what season three is going to bring? John Marcus won't reveal anything and tip cards. Are you excited to see what it brings? Do you think that the idea of barbecue pitmasters should just kind of go away and we'll be done with it? I'm I'm excited to see it, and you know what you have to remember is with all food TV, it's all about what are the viewers wanting, and more than fifty percent of the people who watch cooking on TV don't cook at all. Pregu and boiled pasta is their idea of cooking. So it isn't done for us competition cooks. It's done for the ratings. And I think he's doing a great job for the ratings, which is what it's all about. And the more barbecue on TV, the better for everybody. All right, let's uh, do the Survey Tuesday questions, if you don't mind here real quick, uh, Conrad. Uh, are ceramic cookers overrated? Yes. Yes? They're overrated? Overpriced or overrated? Overrated. I mean, they are awesome for doing steaks and pizza and being very fuel efficient in all weather conditions. But the WSM is still king of the hill for value for money. All right. Question number two, and we kind of already answered this. <laughs> is the Sam's Club National Tour good or bad for barbecue as the sport? Good. All right. I agree. And uh, question number three, very controversial. So I ask you to give me your full honest opinion. Hot and fast or low and slow? Neither. Middle of the road. Middle of the road? That wasn't even an option. What are you talking uh, you don't uh, You don't subscribe to, to one or the other? No, I subscribe to middle of the road. That's how I cook. All right, so give me middle of the road temperature so, we're, so we know what kind of ballpark you're in. 
Um, I'm, I'm talking 250 to 300 is where I want my pit to be. All right, so a little more than one, a little less than the other. Uh, Conrad Haskins runs the Barbecue Institute. He's the pit master for Teddy Bear's competition team. Conrad, always appreciate the time. Thanks for coming out tonight. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. You got it. There he is, Conrad Haskins. Again, Barbecue Institute, if you want to check him out. And uh, I guess what I like best is the fact that the classes that he gives are geared, I guess, more towards somebody like me. Um, so that's a good, that's fun and good, especially if you're looking to save a little money. I mean, you know, not everybody's a competition cook. 